Maybe you use your car key or some other trick to try to remember where it is. Now they paint the, the stalls with different colors, which helps a bit, but then you forget the color. Um, so the way our brain does that, it creates what we call spatial maps. So it uses information in the space, such as a, a lamp or a storefront, um, to create a, a map, to encode a map in our brain that it can then instantaneously re, re, uh, retrieve, again, if you're young. Um, we're not the only um, organism uh, who has the problem that we lose this capacity with aging. Dogs have the same problem, monkeys, um, and mice. And you'll see later how mice struggle when they're old to, um, to do a spatial learning test. So what happens with our brain as we get older? We know that the connections between the brain cells, the neurons, they start to disappear. They're called synapses. They start to disappear as we get older, and sometimes even the neurons start to die and degenerate. The brain actually shrinks. In a 90-year-old person, the brain has lost roughly 10% of its entire volume. We don't know exactly why that is and what exactly is lost, but that's just part of what people call normal aging. But the brain also becomes very susceptible to neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease or other neurodegenerative diseases. And you can just see in this graph here um, how as you get older from 65 to 90, the percentage of uh, people or the per prevalence per 100 people dramatically increases um, in getting Alzheimer's disease. And again, it's really age that is the key driving, the key risk factor to get Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. And the Alzheimer's Association in, in the US here suggests that if you could delay aging by five years, you would half the number of cases who have the disease. So if we could do something about aging, we could actually reduce the risk or the, the number of people with that disease dramatically. That's not how pharma usually thinks because they try to treat one disease at a time and not to try to treat aging. So what we, do we think if we say we want to treat aging or delay aging? Um, there's these two words that people use, lifespan and health span. Lifespan is how many years you live and health span is how many years you live a healthy life. So this is a slide here from Mark Collins from the Glenn Foundation for the study of bio biology of aging. And it, it illustrates this point very nicely. So if you live 85 years on average now, this is our average life expectancy. Most people have about 55 years where they're completely healthy. So I'm just about to hit that uh, time point in, in a couple of years. And then there's the period of disease. And that can be all kinds of different diseases. It can be blood pressure problems, it can be diabetes, it can be um, arthritis, all kinds of these age-related diseases. Some people even get you know, more serious diseases such as cancer. Um, and of course, many of them die. The, half li the, the expected half-life is 85, so that means 50% of the people will not live beyond 85 years of age. So that's pretty miserable, right? If you live 85 years and 30 years of that life, you have some sort of an age-related uh, condition. Um, so we know that nature actually came up with an experiment almost, you could call it. And these people are called centenarians. Centenarians live 100 years or at least 95 years and beyond. And what's really interesting about these people is that many of them are just healthy. You may even know some of them, and, and people sometimes use them to say, oh, you know, this, people, this person has smoked all their life, and look, they're 100 years old. For some reason, they have something in their body that protects them from almost any type of disease. And most of them have never seen a, a physician. And they're sort of a joke. Once they see a doctor, then they get sick. Um, so these people, um, have 90 years or even more without any type of age-related diseases. That doesn't mean they're running like a 20-year-old, but they're just healthy. They're, they don't feel any age-related diseases. And maybe they have only 10 years or so where they're sick. 
So what people in the field are trying to do now in this field of aging research that you may have heard about, and Silicon Valley is sort of getting infamous for this um, uh, health craze and aging craze, if you will. Um, the idea would be that you, if you live 85, of the year, 85 years uh, of life, that you push these 55 years out to 75 where you live healthy, so that you have a much longer health span, and then you die relatively quickly. And I think most of us would prefer that over the sort of long, prolonged um, uh, aging related uh, degenerative changes that, that we have to suffer from today. So this brings us to this idea of the fountain of youth. And this is something almost magical that you find in every culture, every tradition. Um, in, uh, in the Western tradition, this is uh, really nicely illustrated by this painting from Lucas Granach, the Elder, is actually in the Gemälde Gallery in, in Berlin. And what it shows is that old people here enter this fountain of youth and they re-emerge, rejuvenated and young um, on the other side. Now, um, if you look at it uh, more closely, it's actually very sexist because it's only women who enter the fountain because the men, they just get rejuvenated from the young women. Um, I was just thinking in the Middle Ages. Um, but anyway, um, wouldn't it be amazing if somehow we could reverse or slow down aspects of aging and we could extend this health span? What I want to try to uh, discuss with you today and tell you a story is about um, the possibility that we can actually do that, at least in mice, that uh, it might be possible to slow down and reverse aspects of aging, of brain aging in particular, what we have studied, at least in mice, and that this may revolutionize the way we think about aging and how we may treat age-related diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. And this comes about with a somewhat creepy model that you may have heard about. Um, and um, uh, has sort of become a bit infamous, and it's called parabiosis. And parabiosis is basically like Siamese twins. So what we do here is we connect the circulatory system, the blood systems of two mice, a young mouse and an old mouse with each other. And what that causes is that the blood from the young mouse can now flow through the old mouse and vice versa. And this was really used first in more modern times, actually over 100 years old, and was used to study uh, transplant rejections and things like that. And we have benefited a lot from this model in, uh, with modern medicine now. But it was first used by um, my colleague and good friend Tom Randall at Stanford University to study a very interesting question. So if you get old, your muscles start to lose mass. And if you, if you are old, if you're, let's say, 80 years old and you go to the gym and you try to pump iron to grow your muscle, those muscles do not work, uh, do not grow anymore. And they don't grow because your stem cells in the muscle have expired somehow. They don't respond to that signal that the muscle responds so well when you're young. And Tom asked the question, is this because the stem cells lose the activity from something inside the cell, or do they lose this activity because something is missing in the outside? So is there a factor inside the stem cell that is getting lost as you get older, or is it a factor in the environment? And this is how I used this model, parabiosis, to study that question. So he used an old mouse, he injured the muscle of this old mouse, and asked, can he reactivate the stem cells and make them grow again and produce new muscle tissue if he pairs the old mouse with the young mouse? And indeed, that's what he saw. The old mouse would generate muscle tissue almost like a young mouse again uh, in, this, in this model. And that showed for the first time that there are factors flowing around in the young blood, in the blood of these young mice, that could regenerate or rejuvenate stem cells in a muscle. He also found effects on the liver, 
and he had some inkling that there may be an effect on the brain, and that's how we started to collaborate and really explore this more. In the meantime, multiple other groups have shown effects on heart, muscle, pancreas, and other tissues. And we're now at least a dozen labs who can show that factors in the blood of young mice can regenerate and rejuvenate old tissues in old mice. So that suggests that there's factors around flowing in a young body that can somehow make an old organism younger again. What are these factors? Can we find those and can we apply this to humans potentially? So at the heart of all of this, as I told you, is really the blood. So we somehow we connect the blood in these two mice and the blood then transfers these factors. Now you know blood contains cells, it contains red blood cells, white blood cells, it contains all kinds of different molecules, it contains fat, sugars, but it also contains a lot of proteins, different proteins. And we look specifically at how these proteins age. So we can ask them, does blood actually age? If we compare the blood from a young mouse with that of an old mouse, from a young person with an old person, does the composition of that blood change? And specifically, what we're interested in is factors that cells use to talk to each other. And I explain you what I mean with that. So in our body, there's millions and millions of different cells. And somehow they have to talk to each other. Like I talk to you, they use words. These words are proteins. And they have many different proteins. They have thousands of different proteins or words, if you will, in that language that allows these cells in our body to talk to each other. So for example, if you have a cell in your body, let's say this is a brain cell, it can talk to another cell that may be next door or maybe in a different tissue by releasing protein factors that then are recognized by another cell and that triggers a number of different responses. For example, you may tell, you, tell this cell Everything's fine, just keep doing what you're doing. We call these survival factors. These are factors that, for example, our brain depends very much on. If we have less of these uh, survival factors, the brain cells actually die. It could be a signal that says, oh, um, keep, make, make a copy like our immune cells, they actually divide all the time. You make millions and millions of new cells every day. It could be a signal that says uh, become more co co uh, uh, sophisticated and, and talk to other cells. Uh, or it could be a signal to die because the cell is too old. Some cells live only for a few days and they get a signal, it's time for you to go. And these are all signals that cells use to talk to each other. Examples of these are growth hormone, insulin, interferons, and there's many others. Again, as I said, there's thousands of them. And we're trying to understand these words, this language of cells. And I'll come back to that later. So one example that I show you here is where we try to measure many of these words. So here we use blood from healthy people, 400 individuals, age 20 to over 100, so we have some of these centenarians, super long-lived people, they're all healthy, their brain functions normally, and we measure now over a thousand of these different words in the language of cells, in the cellular language, to see how that language changes with age, does it change, and then what are the most prominent changes, and can we learn something about the aging process as a consequence. And I just show you here sort of a, an artistic rendering almost of all the data from these 400 individuals. So here on um, the horizontal axis, you have the 400 individuals, age 20 to over 100. And here you have the 1300 different proteins that we measured. And we show for each protein, for each person, we show if the protein is at a low level, we show it in a blue color, and if it's at a high level, we show it in a yellow color. 
what you can see is that some of these factors tend to be low in young people and they increase with age and often these are inflammatory proteins similar proteins that you get when you have a fever and then on the other hand you find a lot of people a lot of factors that are high when you're young and they decrease as you get older and these are some of the growth factors and survival factors that I mentioned earlier so as we get older our bodies tend to lose good factors that maintain tissues and that keep tissues healthy and they tend to produce factors that are involved with inflammation and injury. <coughs> you can also see that there is almost like, if you sort of um, look from the distance, it's almost like there are some inflection points, one around 50 here, maybe another one around 80. And we're trying to understand, is something going on with our bodies at these ages? Are we aging? Are our bodies starting to show specific changes with age at these, at these uh, specific time points? We can also use this to try to discover a signature of aging. So we can now find what are the key factors that change with age, and can we learn something about that, or can we even predict the age of a person? What we find um, consistently is even if we measure more factors and if we can take completely different people roughly a third of these factors change from young people to old people and we need only five to ten proteins to actually predict the age of a person and this is shown here so here in this graph we um, these are around a hundred individuals and we show again on the horizontal axis the actual age of a person, we call this the chronological age, this is how many years you actually lived. Um, so from uh, 20 to 100, and each circle is one individual. And we take the top, the level of these top factors that change with age, and we now calculate what is the relative age of the person, or the biological age. We know that not everybody ages the same way, right? We, we know people who look much younger than they are, and we know people who look older. We know people who are in much better shape uh, than uh, their, their people who are the same age. So we can then ask, for example, this individual is 70 years of age. So here the chronological age is 70, but if we calculate based on the levels of these factors in their blood, that person looks to be only about 45. So is this a person who looks much younger than age, but maybe more important, is this a person who's going to live a very long life and will not see a doctor? Maybe it's one of these centenarians who is just healthy. And then maybe un more unfortunate, this individual here who is not even 40, but predicted to have a biological age of 65 years of age. Is this a person who is at risk for an age-related disease, maybe already has an age-related disease, maybe has cancer or something else? So if we can predict this, and we're still working on this and finding out whether these are really true signatures, and whether we can predict how these people change with age, if they actually are younger or are older. So this will take us some time but it gives us the possibility to potentially personalize treatments in the future based on your biological age or that your general practitioner would look at you and would administer a biological aging assessment and tell you you should really do some exercise or drink some red wine and stop smoking or do some other health interventions um, or maybe you have to start treatment on a blood pressure lowering or um, your cholesterol is too high. All of these, um, all of these age related changes would be expressed, we think, in an aging signature. So what I showed you so far is that if we look at blood from young and old, we see big differences and we can basically find correlates of aging. Now, as you know, you can always write, read interesting stories in the New York Times or wherever about correlations, right? 
um, and they often don't hold up. So how do we know whether the changes that we see with age are just a correlate of aging, or they actually are involved in the aging of the body? They could actually cause aging or slow down aging. That's really the big question, right? Because if it's just a correlate, we don't care. We know that tall people tend to have bigger shoes, but if you change the size of the shoe, it doesn't affect the height of the person. These are correlations, but what we want to know is the, their biology behind it. So are these factors actually able to modulate the age of an organism? And this is where we come back to this model called parabiosis, or what we actually found, and our lab was in, as strangely the first lab to show that you can simply collect the blood of a young, per, of a young mouse and inject it repeatedly into an old mouse, and you get the same effect almost like this parabiosis model where you suture the mice together. And what we found in this model is that there is increased stem cell activity in the brain of old mice that get young blood administration. They have increased chatter activity between neurons, increased synaptic activity. There's more electrical activity between neurons, and there's less inflammation. And most importantly, you care about function in the end. They're actually functionally doing better. And so, what are the functional consequences of young blood administration? So what I'm showing you here is a modified parking lot test, if you will, for mice. So, mice don't drive cars, but we can actually extract a similar type of memory that we use to retrieve that car in the parking lot with this type of test here. So this is how it works. It's a, it's a table that is about one meter uh, in diameter. It's about a meter above the ground and has a lot of holes. And around the table are the landmarks. Like I mentioned, the storefront or the lamp. We put landmarks for the mice here, a checkerboard, a triangle, a rectangle. And when we put the mice on this table, we shine a bright light on it. And the mice really don't like this because they, they fear that a bird may come and eat them. So they want to escape from this place. And we teach them that they can do this by finding one single hole where we mount a tube underneath. So all the other holes, the mouse would fall to the ground and they don't go there. But we teach them that one hole has a tube where they can hide and feel comfortable. And we actually change the location of that tube. We also change where we enter them into the maze. So what I'm going to show you now is um, an old mouse that was treated as a control just with a salt solution. It was trained for four days and then it was put on this maze to try to remember where it can escape. So let's look how that mouse does. That's a really hard time. It can actually barely remember. At this age, these mice um, have pretty much lost the ability in this challenging test to find this hole. Um, they, they sometimes find it, but it's very difficult for them. The next mouse I show you is the same age, but instead of giving it salt solution, we gave it young plasma, and specifically plasma from the umbilical cord of young uh, babies. So when the umbilical cord uh, from cesarean sections gets discarded and what we did is we just collected the plasma. This is the youngest plasma you could potentially get. And we injected this into these mice repeatedly. Every three days we gave it a very small injection of young plasma, a total of eight injections. And look at how that mouse performs. It doesn't just walk like the previous one, it's almost like it thinks first or it looks around. It's the best mouse we ever had. 
<laughs> That's not, but um, here is the, um, the statistics of, the, of these mice. And so again, these are uh, the old mice that we use. This is that. Just All right. Um, so here you, you see um, how this works. The, um, this is all done blinded. The person who tests the mice does actually not know which ones get treated and which ones don't get treated. Um, and we do this many times. This is one, one example of an experiment. Um, so here are the four days, four trials per day. At the beginning, you have to sort of teach the mice and we almost shove them to that goal so that they get the idea of where that, uh, what they're supposed to do and, and where the hole is. Um, and then every day, we change the location of the hole so they can't know and they have to relearn where do I have to go today. So you can imagine that's actually pretty difficult. And these old mice with sailing uh, don't really do well in that test. But if we give them um, cord plasma, you can see on the first day, they don't show a learning effect. Second day, third day, there's a trend. And then on the fourth day, they show highly significant effects in finding a location of this, um, of this hole. So something in the young blood makes their brain work again more like younger brains. And we see this consistently with a lot of different um, models with um, giving different amounts of blood, and we actually can show that these effects can last for several weeks or even months. So how can we translate um, these findings to effective uh, treatments for millions of people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or other age-related diseases? And I'll show you first of how we approach this in the lab. My lab is an academic lab. We want to understand how does that work. So what we show, if you think about it, we show actually, and, and this could really be transformative to some extent, we show that factors in the blood of, of a person can affect the brain. Well, we don't show in a person, we show it in mice. Um, but we show that we can do that with mouse blood, and we show we can do it with human blood. But the important thing is that these are factors in the blood that have an effect on the brain. So could we deliver drugs in the future through the blood rather than, than having to get them into the brain, which is always the biggest hurdle for pharma industry uh, for any type of drugs uh, for the brain. So we want to understand how does that work. And I'm just showing you um, a quick uh, overview of what we want to do. We want to decipher this language of cells in humans and, and in these mice. We want to find um, uh, this, this magic language here um, and, and uh, find the Rosetta Stone basically of cellular communication and understand how cells talk with each other and how that changes with age. We want to understand what is the genetic basis for this. Are there genes that make the brains more or less susceptible to respond to these factors? And are these genes responsible why some of us age faster or slower, or why some of us get Alzheimer's and others don't. We want to then select key factors and proteins and genes and test them in mice and see can we identify individual factors so rather than just give blood. Can we find the individual components and test them in mice? And we also now, we work with Ed Brune, who uh, pioneered this model, which is a really interesting a fish model that lives only about six months. It lives in ephemeral ponds in, in Eastern Africa, and it has adapted to a lifetime of six months because after, after six or seven months, the, the ponds dry out. And this fish has adapted to a very short lifespan. This is very good for us because mice live three years. If you want to study the effect on aging in a mouse, you have to spend a lot of time and money to learn something. This fish is the shortest lived vertebrate um, that is held in captivity and cannot be studied now. We can rapidly 
modify these genes and proteins and see does that affect fish, fish life. And then ultimately, of course, we want to get into humans. So for the last part of the talk, I want to um, discuss now with you how we translated this, uh, started a company, and what the company is doing, and then uh, we can take questions. Um, these are just a few slides. So based on this idea that young blood may hold this potential of regenerating or rejuvenating brains, um, we decided to start a company. Uh, we, as Kelly Nikolic, who uh, is sort of a serial entrepreneur in, in Silicon Valley, he was at Genentech before, and um, he and I started this company, Alcahez, who's in San, San Carlos now. Um, we have about 40 people. And we, really with this focus of finding innovative therapeutics for age-related diseases, based on these discoveries that there are factors in young blood that benefit the old organism, but also, I didn't tell you, the young mouse in this pair of young and old suffers actually from exposure to the old. So there's bad factors in old blood that are bad for the young organism. So we want to do both. We want to find the good factors and we want to inhibit the bad factors. So Alcahez, the name actually comes from a Swiss compatriot from Paracelsus who was uh, born in the 1600s in, in uh, Einsiedeln. He was just there last year uh, to see where he was. He was a rascal. He, they actually kicked him out of the monastery because he didn't believe in God. But um, uh, he is, uh, he's credited as being the founder of modern uh, pharmacology because he realized that the dose is what makes the toxin. So if you give something of anything, if you give too much, it can be bad. Um, and he was really a pioneer. Um, so Paracelsus came up with this um, name Alcahez as the ultimate solvent that can, um, at the time they thought this will allow them to make gold, but also to find the, the eternal uh, fountain of youth. Um, so it was a bit confusing at the time, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a, I thought it was a good name. Um, we took the concept of using young blood in old mice uh, directly to people because plasma is given in hospitals to millions of people every year across the globe. So uh, we started, uh, once we had the company incorporated, we sponsored a clinical trial at Stanford University. It was carried out by Sharon Shaw, a physician there. And we treated 18 patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease with one unit of plasma, that's 250 mils, and this is similar to what we inject in mice for a single dose. Although in mice we give about eight to 10 doses, in humans, uh, just for logistical reasons, and because these are people, we could not get them uh, to come uh, to the clinic too many times, so we did one unit per week for four weeks. Uh, and this was a safety trial. It was very small. Uh, we found it was safe. But we also found that there were actually some very small effects on what is called daily activities of living. So this is, for example, buttoning your shirt or brushing your teeth or things like that. So the, some of the patients did a little bit better. And this was in the blinded arm of the, of the trial. Um, and it was significant. Now, we don't want to interpret too much. We just want to say that um, it gives us hope to move forward and, and continue in this direction. Um, but also at the same time, this was plasma that came from the Stanford Blood Center, and it's logistically very complicated to match the donor with the patient to get that fresh plasma. Um, it's too complicated. In the meantime, what we did, we actually entered a strategic partnership with Griffles. Griffles is a Barcelona-based company. It's one of the biggest, or now maybe the biggest, plasma product company. They're in the business of making albumin. If you go to the emergency room because you need blood very urgently, often you don't get the whole blood, but you get parts of what the blood consists of, and some of it may be albumin. If you um, uh, have a blood clotting disease, they produce clotting factors that they get out of uh, the plasma from donations. They make all kinds of different products. They make immunoglobulin fractions. 
So when we published our work, they were very interested in collaborating with Alcaraz, and um, they uh, made uh, a strategic investment, an equity investment in our company, uh, and a license, a technology licensing fee, and they basically fund a lot of our research currently. So it's a very uh, mutual, beneficial um, uh, partnership. And what's really most exciting about it is that, uh, as I told you, they, they collect plasma from actually 10,000 donations every day or even more in the US. They pool all of that and then they make these different fractions. And, and these fractions, as I said, they lead to albumin, immunoglobulins, um, clotting factors, and so forth. What this allowed us to do is to test all these different fractions and see which one has the beneficial rejuvenating effects. So we tested these different fractions in our mice and looked which fraction is the most potent. And you know what we found? We found a fraction that is only about 5% of the total plasma that is more potent than the total, and that we can now move forward into the clinic. Um, this is pretty interesting because it suggests, and, and we actually um, knew that, that there are probably also detrimental factors in the plasma. And so if you remove those, you end up with a fraction that is more potent than the whole. So we have now a fraction um, that uh, we call uh, ALK6019, um, which is a plasma-derived product, and uh, we're entering this now into phase 1b, um, phase 2 studies. Uh, they're starting this quarter in Alzheimer's disease, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, uh, in Parkinson's disease, um, and then also we will go into severe Alzheimer's disease. And then we also, um, based on research from our lab, we actually identified one of the bad factors. And we're now using a small molecule that we licensed uh, from Beringer Ingelheim. And we use that small molecule to inhibit bad effects um, uh, of aging uh, factors. Um, so um, the, the company is, um, is, um, uh, has now over 100 patents, and we have this strong uh, partnership with Griffles that I mentioned to you. So what the company is trying to do is two strategies. One is to use plasma and plasma fractions, and the other is to identify individual factors and use those um, as the, uh, treatments or small, small molecules that uh, mimic these effects or block uh, bad factors. Uh, and I think that's it. So I'm happy to take questions um, on any of this, and, and uh, yeah. Just, just quickly, uh, if you donate blood, would that provide some rejuvenation for your your own blood, uh, from bone marrow, whatever? So it's actually be healthy to donate blood. Yeah, that's a really good question. So is it healthy to give old blood? Um, or I'm not sure. If you're young, you may not be helpful. Um, but it's actually not detrimental. There are uh, studies from Griffles and, and, and other companies who, they have these repeat donors who actually donate once or twice a week um, because they donate only the liquid fraction, the plasma. Um, they don't give full blood. If you get full blood, I think you have to wait three months or something like that. Um, so these people actually have some health benefits, it looks like. They have lower cholesterol level. Um, they have some other um, positive um, effects from, from giving plasma, probably because, as, as you suggest, that some of the bad factors will be removed. Um, now, you know, there used to be this practice called bloodletting, um, which uh, was, was actually what Paracelsus fought against at the time, because they would almost kill people with bloodletting. Um, it, it, it doesn't do enough, uh, because you, of course, also give the good factors away. Um, so it's, I think you want to be selective. One approach is that you use one of these machines that takes the blood out of your body, like you use in dialysis, and then you would take out specifically bad factors, and you give the rest of the plasma back, or the rest of the blood. This is one of the strategies that we're pursuing. 
Okay, so this is kind of like a multi-part question. Um, I noticed that you guys in your presentation like focus on plasma. Do you guys look at the bioelectrical aspects of plasma? Because in addition to like proteins, the ions are kind of key to the plasma. And do you think that maybe that has an effect, especially when you're younger, you absorb nutrients a lot better, which is where the ions come from. So as you get older, you don't absorb as easily. Do you think that has an effect on aging? The lack of ions. Yeah. So, so the question is if if um, if ion metabolism um, could could be a, um, one of the factors that is involved in aging. Absolutely, I think we we're not excluding that anything else in the blood um, could be involved in aging. This could involve fatty acids, uh, carbohydrates, and and uh, different uh, ions, um, and you know other small molecules. What we what we do in our studies, we usually dialyze um, the plasma, so we get rid of molecules that are smaller than 2,000 Dalton. Um, and so we know that's not necessary to see the effect. So really small things mm -hmm. uh, are probably not part of it, but that doesn't mean they are not doing anything. Um, you have to be somewhat selective. So what we're trying to say is that we can identify individual good factors or bad factors, but we don't know what all of them are. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering whether the learning curve of the mice depends on the age of the mother when you get to the plasma. Like when your, the plasma comes from older mothers, then you're going to learn to be less than the older mother. You mean? Um, during during birth. So because you were taking the plasma Oh, I see. I see. Yes. Uh, most likely. Yes. Um, uh, we we know that um, there are some factors uh, from the mother that can be found in the umbilical um, blood. Uh, not that many though. Uh, so I think most of the most of the clot. In, um, in the embryo is, is set back to zero, uh, but there are factors from the circulation that can probably affect the, the age. Um, we have not specifically looked at that. Um, you showed a graph that shows on one axis age and on another axis a biological age. Um, would you consider that it's possible to, for example, sort uh, blood based on a biological age, such that then your phenotypes would be much tighter, and you wouldn't have as much variability. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea, um, and you know that's been suggested before. And there's actually now a company uh, that got started that want to identify super donors um, uh, that you know they would be highly educated, uh, they would be athletes, and you know all kinds of things. Um, I'm not sure how much one can predict that. What the, the nice thing about the collaboration with Refolds is that they have donors, they have tens of thousands of donors, and they, you know, they can get um, plasma from, uh, you know, a few thousand 22-year-olds or 18-year-olds. And when you make a pool, it probably doesn't matter as much anymore at that young age. The difference becomes larger and larger between biological age um, as you get older. So in 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds, that difference becomes larger and larger. But, um, and that's in all organisms. The younger you are, the more similar it seems to be the biological age. And then somehow stochasticity, I guess random events lead to a divergence of but it's, you know, it's one possibility, yeah. So, to me, as a layman, obviously, what I see here is what, what brings to mind, blood doping, uh, and you think about this, you know, as you read it in the, in the popular press, right? So, that's a totally different, though, application, and, and, it's, and some of it I don't remember from, you know, seventh grade living science or whatever. So, is it, so one part is, as the muscle tears, it was your example, in an older mouse, it doesn't repair itself, am I understanding this correctly, as quickly 
And then is that then something, is, is that these blood dopers in say athletics, in human athletics, is that something that they were, without the science, trying to, I don't know, uh, leverage? And then second, I'm, I'm aware of this, but there's no science. In thoroughbred horse racing, up until about 2003, 2004, very common in, in rich, high purse races to, and there's no studies, there's no plasma, whole blood, extremely expensive to give a transfusion to a racehorse. But it was something that was done, and it was regularly done, and they don't know, they just felt that it would, it, it would work. So maybe your reactions on that. And then I guess lastly, so you see these strobe light things with Alzheimer's treatment that's been in the popular press recently, and I know that's not what you're dealing with here, but I'd love to hear if you have impressions on the interplay between the two. And then lastly, outside the scope, I'd love to know how that uh, intellectual property relationship you have with Stanford and your company, but you may be off. Okay. Um, okay, let me see how much I can remember for different items. Um, the blood doping, um, actually Switzerland is infamous. The, the, you know, the clinic at LA Geneva that has been doing blood doping um, from sheep and all kinds of things. Um, uh, stem cell therapies. Uh, the, the, the idea is the same, that um, there are factors produced from young tissue um, that um, are somehow beneficial for the organism. Part of the blood doping, though, is simply using red blood cells, so that if you provide a lot of red blood cells, the same that you have an altitude effect, right? You can go to 4,000 meters and you spend a couple weeks there and then you come down and you have an overload of red blood cells, so your body functions much better. So I think the, the, the thoroughbreds, um, the, you know, the cyclers, when they did blood doping, it was mostly with that effect. But um, red blood cells also produce many of these growth factors and, and, and um, the platelet therapies that people use, that they, now platelets get injected everywhere, right, when you have injuries. Um, those platelets are very rich in growth factors. It has not been used um, now in the context of using platelets from young people into old people, but you would expect that you get even better effects. Most of the platelet treatments are your own platelets. Uh, the physician will take your blood, uh, isolate the platelets, and then inject the platelet um, concentrate into an injured muscle or in an injured um, uh, tendon or something like that. Um, Question of remind me the, so, uh, the third one. The strobe light thing. Oh, the strobe light thing. Out. Yeah, this is based on studies that were done in mice that uh, there seem to be some called gamma oscillations that you can activate in in um, in nerve cells that then lead to um, the clearance of some of this amyloid that material that uh, accumulates in the brains of Alzheimer's. Um, and in, in mice, at least, that works. Now, I think it's way too early to do that in humans. Um, uh, people really need to figure out first what is the, what is the basis of this and, and can this be translated. I think some people want to push this forward. Uh, there's more than one lab that has been able to show it in mice, but um, I think it's a bit too early to use it in humans. Um, and then lastly, the intellectual property. Um, we have very strict rules um, of how um, you work in an academic lab is different from, uh, from your company. The, um, the discoveries that you make in your lab um, are, you know, you can patent them, um, the university then license them, and you can start a company and license that IP to start the company. Um, but um, the company doesn't have access to my lab. Um, the lab has no access to the company, uh, so there is a there is called a, a barrier. Um, but the idea is, of course, that um, what we do in our labs is funded by public dollars mostly, and um, without uh, the, the the researchers and universities starting companies, that intellectual property, that knowledge, uh, is basically. And if it's not patented, it's also useless because nobody will uh, move it forward and try to um, develop a drug out of it. So it's a complicated um, uh, relationship to some extent, but it's often the, 
the only person who can move an idea forward is the person who discovered it. And if they don't move it forward, um, pharma has way too many ideas that they could follow up on. So if you don't start uh, a company and move this to a level where it shows the promise that pharma needs to develop a drug, uh, it will basically die and will be useless information. Not useless information, but useless for, for the potential treatment of the disease. Yeah. Well, are all those factors that you take into account calculated by a lot of guidance, is there something that one that is particularly related to disease? Is there a specific disease that may the case biologically? This is the first question. And secondly, it seems to me that chronic inflammation is a response of the body to something. If you go in there and you remove the transfusion and the filtering, all those factors that are your body responding to those stimuli, is it going to be like letting all those things that you lose go crazy in your body? Yeah, so that, these are very good questions. So um, the, maybe I, I, I'll answer your inflammation question first. So it, it is very interesting that as we get older, um, most of our tissues become inflamed. Um, and why that is, we don't really know, but it, it seems to be related to the aging process per se. And maybe what happens is that um, cells get older and they are not as efficient anymore. And the immune system starts to think there's a problem there. And so the immune system gets activated trying to fix an old cell. But an old cell, you can't fix. It's not like there's a bacteria that you can just eat and get rid of. So the body starts to um, think that there is an infection or there's a problem. And as a response, it starts to attack and make things worse. So that's like you get degeneration of your bones and things like that, arthritis, um, many different. Uh, in the brain, we have inflammation. Now, we know that the original idea, as you suggest, of inflammation is a good one. If you don't have an immune system, you, you will die of, of any type of inflammation. But the chronic inflammation that our body starts as a response to aging is probably mostly detrimental. But still, it has some good aspects as well, which try to regenerate the tissue. So it's, we have to figure out which are the good aspects, which are the bad aspects, uh, to, really, uh, to really figure that out. And your first question was? Sorry, one of those, uh, I mean, all the factors you take into account calculate the biological aging. If there are some of those, I assume it's chemical kinds that you're measuring. Mm -hmm. Is there some, some related to specific diseases? Is there something that makes us age faster? Yeah, makes so. Us younger, so it's actually one of the questions we're really interested in and, and excited about is, um, and you know, aging in general is, is an extremely interesting uh, topic. Um, organisms have very different lifespans. Why is that? Um, and when we age, are all our cells, are all our organs aging at the same speed? Um, are there tissues in our body that age faster or slower? And are the ones that age faster actually infecting the other tissues and make them also age? Um, so are there then specific factors that are mostly aging factors for one tissue or another, and could you target those? Eotaxin, which we are pursuing, is, is one of these um, uh, chemokines that is known to be essential for um, a, um, an, a type of in inflammatory response. It actually brings cells to sites of inflammation. It can attract cells and call them in. Um, this factor seems to, with age, somehow increase and have now a bad function in the brain. Why that is, we don't know. But um, it's also involved in asthma and allergies and has been targeted there. There's a lot of things that we don't understand yet, but it's interesting, this concept, that some of these factors may come from one specific tissue and then promote the aging process. Okay. I'm wondering to what degree uh, bouts of hyperglycemia contribute to this kind of chronic inflammation. So one way to look at that is whether there, what the, if, if 
there any diabetics who have a below norm biologic age or that tend to skew high? And what insights do you have about the sort of recent months of hyperglycemia from the A1C on a hemoglobin? Um, and how, what insights do you have about that kind of derangement of metabolism and, and the chronic inflammation and the accelerated aging that's at least visually, clinically, is a lot of what happens in diabetes? Yeah, I think that that's, a, that's another good point. I think most of these age-related changes in diabetes is, is often age-related. Um, lead then to uh, inflammation, and that inflammation often feeds forward, back forward, to make the diabetes even worse. Um, so I, I think interfering with any of these processes could potentially slow down um, the diabetic process as well. Uh, it's interesting that, um, again, this factor that I just mentioned before has also recently been linked to um, uh, fat metabolism. Um, so it could, it could have a role in, in regulating metabolism as a whole. And aging is, is closely related to uh, metabolism. We have time for one or two more questions. You pick. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, going back to the specificity of the essay. So uh, I think one thing that we might need to consider the genetics, like uh, what the aging is related to based the kind of the common variance in the whole population might affect the aging process. So the process that you are interrupting here is the nature of uh, growth of the whole, like evolutionarily how it basically evolves. So let's say if you have a mutation in a particular disease, you go in this particular mutation and then you fix it and then you face aim that you will revert this process. But a process like a, a aging, if you introduce a, like opposite uh, reaction that might block the immune system or revert the uh, growth process that might induce tumorigenesis or cancer or in the other case like you might get sick and die out of flu when you are blocking the inflammatory processes. So what will be the off-target effects of this whole thing that can really be detrimental even if you are old? Yeah, that's, that's something that we will have to be, um, you know, careful about and, and look at. Um, that's why I do safety studies. Um, it's possible, and this has been brought up before, that if you give an old person young blood and many of these growth factors that a young organism uses, that this could trigger tumor formation. Um, now, our, our trial was very short, and so we can't really say safe, uh, but we know from the mice that there's actually a, a reduced tumor incidence uh, in the mice uh, uh, rather than an accelerated one. Now, again, one has to be careful uh, how you translate that to humans, but um, I, I, I totally agree we have to be careful, we have to look of what we regulate. Um, the beauty of using plasma is that it is the natural cocktail that um, evolution you know, generated in, in hundreds of millions of years, if you will. And that, that uh, using that, um, that natural product may be better than using one individual factor or two or three individual factors, which is much more dangerous because then you activate one specific pathway uh, with a very strong sledgehammer, if you will, whereas the plasma is a lot of factors, a very little bit, and that may be more natural than, um, than uh, an individual factor. One more question. Who is it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's maybe more of a personal question. So you said you've been here in statistics for the last uh, 20 years. If you miss it, you... <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, yes, I do miss Switzerland. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think um, Heimweh uh, is something that uh, is sort of a quintessential Swiss um, that, you know, we, we always like to go back. Um, but then I always like to come back here. So I think after a few, uh, well, after years or maybe decades, 
um, you will have a split personality. Uh, and now if I go to Switzerland, I defend uh, the US way of living uh, to the Swiss who are sometimes very ignorant about things outside Switzerland. And when I'm here, um, I defend uh, Europe and Switzerland. Uh, and I think that's really what, what makes it uh, so important that people, you know, exchange and, and go from one place to another. But yeah, I haven't abandoned Switzerland. <laughs> Thank you very much.